So I, I want to talk to you today about how we've applied machine learning in our open source software projects for, for a specific uh, purpose of finding bugs. And we come, up, come around to this in a roundabout way, so I hope you'll follow me along. But my goal today is not necessarily to convince you to use this, although you're welcome to. Anyone here can use it. It's simple. But to, to figure out how to think about this, how to use these techniques in your projects in the places where it might be uh, applicable. And Rado is doing just that. Rado recently contributed to this and started hacking on um, using some of these same concepts, some of the same code for the kernel. So I'm going to go through a case where we used it for cockpit, and then I'm going to hand it over to Rado to explain how he's starting to use it for the kernel. So take a step back. Martin Pitt um, has made this claim. Any sufficiently complex system will have bugs. Bugs are entropy, and entropy is fundamental to this universe. Your software has bugs. Get over it. The question is how bad they are and how easily you find them. In addition, I will make this claim. Any sufficiently complete testing system will be plagued by test flakes. You will not be able to get rid of them. Here's an example, the cockpit integration test. We run, uh, this is 90 days of data. Actually, this is old data, so I apologize for that. I think this, is, this was from last year. 90 days of data running uh, two and a half million integration tests, full integration tests, booting Linux or booting multiple systems and having them talk to each other and then shutting it down and running the next one and so on. As you can see, when we look at this data, we have 122 thousand failures. And we track known issues, so bugs in other people's code. Everyone's code is shit, except for your own, right? Um, and that, that accounts for 54,000. And then when we look at the actual data, I'll show you how we do this, we find out that of the remaining failures, there are 25,000 test flakes, which is a lot. Why is this a lot? Because CI systems and testing systems typically if you run 1,000 tests, if you go and open a, a pull request against cockpit, um, something like 2,000 VMs will start up, 2,000 integration tests, and, and 3,000 unit tests, like lots of tests will run. One failure means it goes red. So test flakes, even though they seem like a small percentage of the total amount, have a big impact on the project. So 25,000 test flakes, that's a decent amount. And so this is the situation. Any sufficiently uh, complete testing system is plagued by test flakes. So when you have this much data, what do you do? You apply machine learning. You pour the data into this big pile of linear algebra and collect your answers out on the other side. And if the answers are wrong, you just stir harder. <laughs> I'm going to show you how to do that stirring. But more to the point, what I'd like to, make, what I'd like to say Oh, let's just talk about how we make this data first. Um, we can tell whether someone thought a certain test failure was a test flake, a false positive, by whether the fact that that commit was merged into the master of the project or not. So let's say I open a pull request, and I see test failures. Now, if they're, are, if they're related to my change, I typically will make a change to the pull request, push another commit onto it, either force push or add a fix up, and then that will get merged. If I believe that they're a flake, the behavior will typically be that I either re-trigger those tests, get it to green, and then push it. So exactly the same commit gets pushed that failed. Or it just gets pushed anyway, someone ignores the, the results, waves the results and says, go for it. So we can tell by whether a certain commit was merged or not, that revision up there on the second line was merged or not, whether a human thought it was a flake or not. They're not, exact, they're not always perfectly right, but we can use this as a source of data. Um, just to give an idea of the, the scope of this problem, Cockpit is not some little uh, uh, web interface that does you know, happy little JavaScript things. It talks to over 90 different parts of Linux, each of which are 
are, are going forward at their own pace, their own release schedule, and across all sorts of different distributions. Um, and we try to make this work across all of these. Cockpit is talking directly to every one of these systems. So you can imagine the amount of test flakes, possible test flakes, um, that could happen in this scenario. So I would like to make the claim that test flakes are bugs, the bugs that Martin was talking about. The test flakes are those bugs. They are representations of that entropy in your software. The bugs that must exist show up as test flakes. We typically treat them as some kind of annoyance that we have to get rid of. Make the test flakes stop, when in fact, they are showing us where the bugs in the software are. Not necessarily bugs that happen every time in the software, but bugs that happen under load, bugs that happen under bad timing, bugs that happen one every 10,000 runs that you will never, ever be able to reproduce when a user or a customer reports it to you. Here we have this treasure trove of data. How can we use it? These tests are fuzzing Linux. Much like a typical fuzzer will go in and change the inputs um, and, and mutate them to see if there's a bug related to input data, these tests are essentially fuzzing Linux from a different angle of timing, uh, of, of races, of, of how close to boot, how much entropy is on the system already, all sorts of different variables there. So how do we apply machine learning to this? We, were, we, we went through various techniques, but eventually we, we thought about unsupervised clustering, where we basically ask uh, machine learning to cluster these failures in such a way that related ones come into a cluster, um, and then things that have no relation or one-offs are, are the noise behind the scenes. They're not in any cluster. So you can kind of see a, a model here. This is just a, a random graphic. I'll show you a real one later. Um, and that, that's at least the theory. The theory is the bigger the cluster is, the more certain we are that that cluster is a bug, whether a bug in the tests or a bug in the software. I mean, that's really the same thing. Tests are software. And the ones that, that, are, that are in the background are, are what we usually associate with false positives and, uh, and, and flakes. They're a network outage or a running on a particular system that is actually broken, something unrelated to the software itself. So how do we go about this? How do we cluster these? So here's the techniques that we use. Of course, we do some pre-processing on the data. That's typical. Then we use TF-IDF, term frequency, inverse document frequency. I'll show you how we use that effectively here. We use normalized compression distance to figure out how similar two things are. This is an amazing technique that's so simple. Um, we use DB scan, unsupervised clustering, then and multidimensional scaling, and lastly, to figure out how, how close a new result is to any of the existing clusters we use, k-nearest neighbors classification. So what does the raw input look like? The raw input is just garbage, logs that come out of the tests. And af after you're familiar with a project, suddenly this starts to make sense to you. Right now, this probably looks like a lot like line noise to a lot of people. I mean, you can kind of tell there's a stack trace in there, but there's just a bunch of useless data. What we typically see is that as you become more familiar with looking at these flakes, you ignore certain lines just as, as any of us ignore certain lines. For example, me working on the project for a long time, I would ignore these lines at the bottom. Can I point to things? Woo. I would ignore these lines here because I know, hey, after a test like a failure happens, these lines just uh, uh, happen by itself. They dump out data. Yep, Adam? Could you speak up? I, I can't hear you. Right, good. So someone who's familiar with Linux knows exactly what happened here. Um, Adam says this is waiting for a network interface to show up um, to appear, and it didn't, int it didn't appear. So let's talk about this, though. This is what, we look, what would seem like a test flake, a network interface that's not in the right place at the right time. Um, however, it turns out this is a bug. This is a bug in Cockpit that if you ran Cockpit at the right time and your network wasn't showing up or whatever, it would crack. It would have a, a, an, accept, an exception. And so it really is a bug. 
even though at first glance it looks like, oh, networking outage, some kind of thing like that. Once we did this, we find out that this was a bug. So let's, let's go through this example a little further. So what do we do next? We hope that the thing works, yeah. So first thing we do is we do a bit of sanitization on the data. This is always a dangerous topic because it's easy to micromanage your data and start to kill the source of your data, but this is the amount that we found actually works. It's easy to match with regular expressions to go through and say all GUIDs, replace them with Xs. I don't care about that. When we look at data, we see GUIDs as just exactly the same. Uh, we ignore that they're different, really, when we're looking for this kind of stuff. All numbers, gone. Now, that might seem like a bold statement. This actually worked for us. Numbers all replaced with zeros. Um, files, paths, went down to their final path name in the stack traces. You can see that. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that's changed here, a lot of things that have gone down. These are generic things that, that, that are not related to the actual stack trace, uh, to this particular stack trace that you could apply to other data as well. And so they're relatively safe, and we found them to work here. So what's next? after you do this. The data has sort of cleaned itself up a bit, but hasn't gotten very far. We apply term frequency inverse document, uh, doc frequency. Now typically how this is used, this is a, a simple technique in, in, uh, in machine learning or, or data processing, where we look at how often across all of the various, in this case test logs, does a certain term occur. And if it occurs across a large percentage of them, Ignore it. It's not unique data across them. We don't care about that. Ignore that. So we're doing it actually more like line frequency inverse document frequency. We treat a whole line as a term. So first we normalize them, zeros, and get rid of the paths and all these GUIDs and all that kind of stuff. And then we go and say, what are the lines that have showed up across too many tests to be interesting? These are the lines that you would typically ignore as a, as a uh, uh, developer on the project. For example, if you see an, a log with um, warning, added so-and-so IP address to known host file in your log output, you literally skip over that while you're looking at it. Like, it's kind of just noise to you, and this is uh, a machine doing a similar thing. So I think, I think I might have turned the knob up a bit here on how much of the data it dropped, but I wanted to show you the effect. Um, it, I, normally it's about, I would say about twice that amount comes through. But basically, the effect is that really you can, you can fine tune this knob to say how much resolution do you want of, of what data shows up. Basically, it, it says it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a setting that you can, you can change and, and say across how many percent of the documents would a certain term have to appear or a certain line have to appear before you just drop it. So we come down to a uh, a piece of useful information here. So now, this is a, th maybe I'm easily impressed, but I really love normalized <laughs> compression distance. This is a technique that, sh that allows you to take two pieces of data, any pieces of data, and ask the question, are they similar or are they dissimilar? And how similar are they in comparison to each other? Uh, it just uses compression. So, if Z here was a compression algorithm, Zlib, LZ4, anything, um, well, Z is actually, sorry, well, let's skip here. Z is the length of the compressed data that's input, just the length. So you take the length of X compressed, you take the length of Y compressed, and you take the length of X concatenated with Y compressed, you pass it through this very, very simple little algorithm, and you get a number between zero and one that tells you whether two things are similar or not similar. This is using compression to do this, and this actually works with any data that's not compressed. Um, so you can do this with two songs and figure out whether they have similar beats. You can do this with two images and figure out if they have similar areas of, of patterns or color or anything. Compression works for this because this is the fundamental theory um, that drives compression. The sad part about this, this, uh, this particular technique is it doesn't work on GPUs because compression is not parallelizable, and so it's expensive, but it works beautifully, and turns out that we have more than enough CPU power in the world to power this. Yeah. 
So, so we get out a number between the two test logs of whether they're uh, near or far. It's, we make no claim about where they are or what cluster they are between. We can ask the question about any two test logs, how, how similar are they? And using that distance-based metric, we can use a very basic algorithm. The, so all the techniques I'm going through here are some of the most basic machine learning techniques that if you load up scikit-learn and try out machine learning, these are, these are the first things you touch. And you can use them to good effect. So dbscan is your basic, fundamental, simple, unsupervised uh, clustering algorithm. Um, it basically asks, it, it starts enumerating through the, through the different nodes and asks what are the ones that are close within a certain, certain distance um, to that and starts joining them into a cluster and, uh, and then goes through and, and, and allows it to figure out that, that even, it, even if it doesn't know in Euclidean space where these things are, the fact that they're all related to each other, they come together. But one of the cool things about uh, dbscan is that um, it also has noise. So many of the clustering algorithms try to force everything into a certain cluster or not, whereas dbscan um, has a noise concept. And that fits with our theory very well, the theory that certain things will not cluster. They're just random failures. And so noise uh, shows up as, a, as its own kind of outliers. And then, because we wanted to make this approachable by people. So all of that is enough to then drive the use cases I'm going to show you how we use this in a second. But we also want people to be able to comprehend this. We are very, very poor at comprehending the fact that there's a bunch of stuff in space, and somehow we don't know where they are, but they are this distance from each other, and like your head explodes. So um, what Rado uh, brought this fundamental, simple little technique is if you treat every single one of those distances as its own dimension, you can use multidimensional scaling to make an image out of it, make it approachable in two or three dimensions for our, our unfortunately uh, simple brains. And the reason for that is because we want people to be able to hack on this, to use it, to ask questions about it, to be able to say, hey, how can I make this better? It's not working. What happens when I twist the knobs? And then lastly, when we have a new test log coming in, after we've done all this training, we can pass it through the same pre-processing, the same TF-IDF, and then ask the question, which of the clusters that were found is it most similar to? So let's, so now we know all the techniques that are in play, how we do that, let's make this do something. So one of the first things we did was take this and retry tests that we think were flaky. If there was a pretty good chance that the test was flaky due to the machine learning, we'd retry it. And what this does is it also helps reinforce um, the machine learning. If it retries it and it passes, then it's even more likely that it's flaky and so on. So it, it builds this source of data. So this has been running now for about a year um, on retrying flaky tests and allowing them to be handled uh, separately and not interrupt the workflow so much. For new flaky tests, because this, remember this is a sliding window of like 90 days of data that's constantly moving and the project is constantly changing. The kinds of test logs that are failing are constantly moving. So obviously um, humans continue to have to train this, continue to have to have their default behavior of saying this failure is not related to my thing and I'm going to prove it, or I'm going to try it. No, this is different. I didn't even touch that part of the code and, uh, and try to either rerun the test to get them green or to merge the code anyway. So, but this is another source of data that then comes back into the, into the model. Obviously, we annotate test logs with, with how likely it is that, uh, this is an old screenshot actually, but how likely it is that it's a, a flake. And then we, uh, this is old, it's a shame. When it's a flake, we actually ask the person who's reading this to say, if this is not a flake, File a bug, because that's a bad thing. You know, like trying, trying to interact with people and make sure that they understand what's going on. Um, wow, what happened there? Is that a bug in the slides? That's a flaky slide. Goodness gracious. OK, hold. Um, obviously, each test has a name. 
Um, and it's trivial to figure out then using this model which tests have always been solid, which ones are flaky, which ones are not, and so on. We start to use that to good effect. Um, in, last, uh, in the last month or two, Marius uh, made a change to the, to the bots that, that, that use the machine learning to start to file bugs for the biggest clusters and figure out, hey, this is flaky, but it, it's one of the biggest clusters. That the 10 biggest clusters get bugs, so people go and investigate them. This is just one that was recently filed. Um, on, and it, it gives you the information. I think we could get more information here. Actually, if you click on, well, I'm not going to click. But under source material, there's much more information about um, the flake itself so that we can actually start to investigate these. Basically, percolate up these things and say, this is, a, this is almost certainly a bug either in the, in the tests or in the software, and we need, to, uh, we need to investigate it. We need to fix it. And now, perhaps. So let's look at, uh, let's look at this. So this is running Kubernetes. Um, in our OpenShift cluster. And there's a, there's a standard way to post data, predict stuff, and, and I'll show you the readme for that. But uh, wait a second, I actually have this open over here. It dumps out all of the various clusters that are found and the log for the machine learning, of course, and like all of that stuff. And various statistics in this file. Here's the actual machine learning model. Here's the data that was used to input it. You can see even compressed just a decent amount of data. And, uh, and so you can, we can go in and investigate this and play with it and ask questions about it uh, rather easily. One of those things in that directory is visualization. Every time that this happens, there's a visualization output. And uh, this is actually very recent, so that's kind of cool. And you can, you can this, is, this visualization is for no other reason than to allow people to say, wait a second. What happens if I change this or that doesn't look right? And to be honest, right now, it doesn't look right. So well, a lot of it does look right. So keep in mind that this is like the stars in the sky, kind of you, two stars that look close to each other may not be close to each other uh, just because you know, we're looking at it in two dimensions. So it would be nice to kind of look at this in three dimensions, of course, and, uh, and add a little more fidelity to this. But, but and we can do that with D3 or, or other uh, techniques, but you know. I only get to hack on this on my, uh, my, and during the holidays, so wait for the next holiday. Or maybe Rado will do it. And then we can, uh, we, can, we can see it in three dimensions. But nevertheless, we see some of the clusters. We see this big cluster here of, of, uh, of failures that are all related. So a single color here is related. We see tons of other little clusters that have worked together. Um, and we start to be able to ask questions such as, what the hell is going on here? Something is wrong. Um, it's possible, it's possible that this is noise across, scattered across all these different dimensions that somehow is being compressed there. But at least let's ask the question and figure out, wait a second, why is all this noise not being clustered? Is it really far apart in distance or is, it, or is there a bug somewhere? So this allows us um, to, to start to interact with this and, and figure it out. Um, ah! Goodness gracious. Wow, this is like, I think I can do this. Um, so where are we? OK, make it do something. So here's an example of a couple bugs that, that were found um, due to this. Um, the one that was actually really interesting was this one here. Uh, for a while in Fedora 29, just randomly, every thousand boots or something, there was a race between network D and SE Linux, and the system literally would not boot. Literally just um, stopped the boot and went into emergency mode. Um, and you know, you might think of that as a flake. You might think that that is a flake of, oh, shitty testing system again, just falling over, what the hell? But no, that was a real bug that someone would have had on their laptop, on their server, and it would have just literally not a booting system. And when you can't access that system, it's, it's a painful thing to have a not booting system. So here's what, that was one that was found, um, and that, I thought that was pretty cool. There's another one here which is a little more embarrassing. Um, for about two years, or maybe three even, before we did this, there was this stupid test flake that kept coming up in cockpit as, a, as we were developing it. 
And it was the most annoying thing, because every once in a while, this whole user account page would just, for no reason, end up in these strange states. And, uh, and we were always like, these tests are such crap. You know, let's fix the test. And we're constantly trying to fix the test in different ways. Once this, uh, once this um, was implemented, we looked at it, and it's like, my god, that's a lot of related tests, that related failures together. And it turned out there was a real problem in, in Cockpit, a real problem with racing, invoking tools, invoking the shadow utils, user add, reading the password file, and so on, too fast. And when you did it too fast, or the connection was slow enough that the results wouldn't come back enough, and they were racing with each other, there were significant bugs there. So and Zana fixed that page. I think it's mostly fixed now. But it shows that when you're, doing, when, you're using these, when you're using machine learning, often things that are not intuitive to you start to come to the fore. And you have to listen a little bit. You can't just force your opinion on machine learning on, on these techniques. You have to listen to what's coming back. Or else um, you, know, you're, you have a mindset that, that sometimes is hard to, hard to change. There's other, several other uh, bugs that were found. I mean, there's lots of these. There's just a few examples. But package hit crashing. Or of, uh, or of uh, UI states being in, invalid. And they're, yeah. And these continue. I think, I, th I believe that there's many more that we can find here. As we scale up the amount of testing that we do and the data that we do, we will just find more and more and more of these. You need to first scale up your testing to a significant level before this starts to make sense. So, what if you wanted to do this? How could you, how could you use it? Well, it's in, a, it's in a GitHub repository. And there's a readme file for how to hack on it, how to, how to work with it. It's, uh, that's, that link leads here. So it tells you how to prepare the data, how to uh, format it, put it in the right form. That's always the important part. And then you can use these tools to, to train stuff. and. Uh, and I'll take you through some of these on the next slides. But there's a readme file with all that information there. So you clone the repo. You can pass the data into this training thing, into this training script. And it trains, your, your, uh, it trains the model, tells you how many clusters you have, outputs all that stuff you saw, the, the image, the, the, the various files, and the, the cluster, and so on. And then you can use this command here to predict. And the prediction is interesting because we try, we try to train only on very little. We try not to over uh, micromanage the training. We really just train on whether two test logs are similar. We could probably add a couple more va variables there, but we really didn't want to add too many. We want to instead ask questions about the clusters that come out, rather than forcing them to be segregated by various properties. So for example, we pass this data in, which is in the same format as the data um, that's training. We pass this data in, and here's the, the results. It says, well, this is most likely two failures that occurred in these two different tests. Five times in this one, two times in this one. This is a simple example. Um, it happened, there were seven failures. It happened across these two. Oh, that, that's a, obviously a typo in my slides. But in these two operating systems, let's pretend this says Fedora 29, or something else. Oftentimes, this is across all Linuxes or across a very specific one, like RHEL 7 or something like that. Here are the dates between which it happened. Here's whether it was uh, merged, whether this broken, where typically commits in this cluster were merged. Um, in, in other words, they were false positives. Whether they were not merged, in other words, they were likely to be uh, uh, true positives, I mean, you know, not flakes. And then null is unknown. We have no idea what happened here. And then also, hey, we, we track stuff for known issues. We start to track different test failures and categorize them as, hey, that's a bug over there. We're going to track this. We're going to associate it with its bugzilla or with, the, with its uh, issue tracker. And so this source of data allows us to say, hey, how likely is this related to another known bug or not? And I think if we scroll off, well, I don't know how scrolling works here, but that's actually a bug. And it tells you what percentage of this cluster is, um, is a known bug. You can obviously use this in Kubernetes. It's all containerized. So you push it to your Kubernetes project, and it'll go and walk this stuff uh, for you, walk the data for you. And then there's a, a way to post data into it to train it using a standard uh, put or post uh, command. There's a way to 
again, with a post to send your data to be predicted, and you get back um, output similar to the, to the previous page. Like this output, you get back by an HTTP request. So it's really easy to integrate into your project. What's next? Well, oh, actually, this part's not merged yet, sadly. But there's an uh, additional pull request. I don't think it's even done yet. Well, mostly done. To automatically retrieve data from GitHub. So to make it really easy for you to add this to your project, should you want to. To pull in data from all your GitHub statuses and failures and just constantly shove that into um, the training. And then tracking known issues automatically would be good. Right now, we file bugs for the biggest uh, failures, the biggest clusters. But what we, what we should probably do is try to associate those with the known problems and start to interact with them and put comments on them and reinforce um, some of the bugzillas and say, this is happening every other day, or a whole bunch of this just happened with this change, and start to give more feedback back into Bugzilla and all the other places where these, uh, failure, these known issues are tracked. So I'm going to hand it over to Rado. Do you want the mic? Hello, hello. Um, so when I first uh, saw Steph's presentation uh, about his machine learning project, I was thinking like, wow, this is a cool toy. I want to have it too. And uh, since Steph is talking about finding Linux bugs uh, in general, there is no way we, we can avoid talking about the kernel itself. Um, how do I use it? Next slide. Yeah, that's the one. Um, but when it comes to debugging the Linux kernel, it kind of stands out compared to other user space applications. Um, the usual approach, turn it off and on again, doesn't really scale well with Linux. Uh, debugging is almost impossible in real time, although we have these great applications like SystemTap. Um, usually the machine stands somewhere between the firewall of the customer and us, and we have no direct access to it. When Linux does crash, all we get is a scriptic error message on the console and uh, the image of the corrupted system if we have kdump enabled. Um, but when it does come from the customer, um, it has to be manually picked up and analyzed by a human being. Uh, we have special tools for that, like crash. And it requires a certain skill set to go through all these structures inside the Linux kernel. You have to be really skillful and uh, understand what's happening there, expect certain values. But all this, uh, all that um, stuff is not relevant for the customer. He's not user of the arcane. All he wants is a single button solution. Um, and sometimes, uh, even for the uh, engineers looking at a certain bug, um, if you are stuck on a certain bug, it can help you if you have a similar bug that can lead you to a solution. So what I came with uh, using uh, Steph Walter's machine learning libraries and the data we have gathered from the customers, uh, I put together, uh, it's not directly, directly a tool yet, it's more of a technology, technology preview of a tool that will come. And um, it uses uh, kernel, kernel messages as input and using clustering and uh, normalized compression distance tries to um, like tell you the nearest or the, the best uh, other matches that, are, that have solutions uh, inside our uh, knowledge database. Yeah. Cool. That's all. Oh, you can have it. There'll be questions. Um, yeah, and I'm excited to see that. And so I'm excited to see us applying this technique to other places. Um, it's not hard. The total amount of code here is 800 lines of Python. And it's, it's scikit-learn. It's running on bog standard CPUs, no GPUs involved. This is easy. Practicing how to apply these techniques. I think we went through some bad bad techniques first. We tried to apply neural networks to this. It didn't work. Neural networks don't have a concept of noise. They do this weird thing where, in the typical example, you, 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 you try to classify human handwritten numbers, right? So all 100,000 digits of, of training data, you put it into machine learning, and suddenly it's telling you pretty well, oh, that's a three. 
That's a four, that's a five. But when you, when you put trash into machine learning, at least naive machine learning, I'm sorry, neural networks, um, when you put line noise in instead of a, a digit, it'll confidently tell you, oh yeah, yeah, that's a four. It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not unsure, so it has less of a concept of unsurety. So it was a poor choice for modeling this sort of uh, data with tests and a, a constantly moving uh, unsupervised set of data. Um, but we learned from that. We applied different techniques, and it's really, really easy. Once you get practice with this, it, it's more natural, and you can just apply it to your project. So I'd like to make a ludicrous claim, and I, be, I think this is a little bit forward thinking. Um, eventually, I'd like to, we'd, I'd like to uh, uh, prove that test flakes are almost always bugs. And eventually, if your testing system does not have enough flakes, then your testing system is not working correctly. Linux has bugs. Martin Pitt said so. Uh, the universe has entropy. And if your testing system is not finding that, and you're not being forced to react to that using techniques like this or other techniques to mitigate that, it means your testing system is not working well enough. So rather than flakes being a source of annoyance, something to be squashed and gotten rid of, it's a source of value, something that we can actually actively use to make our software better. It's telling us, it's shouting at us, here are the bugs, and we're not listening. So I'm excited about this. The first step is ramp up your source of your, your data, how many tests you're running to a high level. Tons of kernel stack traces, tons of test results, millions of test results. In both these cases allow us to apply these techniques. We can't apply it to small amounts of data. It doesn't really work. So once we get it up to that level, we know we've played with this. And, and this is just the beginning. There are so many tools at our disposal to then use all of that data to our advantage. All right, questions? So yeah? If you're calling those logs and you're getting rid of the things that you think are just everywhere and they're not meaningful, do you have some way of testing known problems if you know where the answer is and you know that one of those things is actually a smoking gun and the reason it's showing up so much is because there's a real problem with it? Have you like, explored that? No. Yeah. Um, so that's a good question, and the question is about um, do we validate our model? Do we check that a known uh, issue is not ignored and the data is not lost and it, it actually is clustered correctly in the model? Um, so I say today we do that poorly, and the way we do it is via testing. We have a, a model of data that we pass through and expect it to make these decisions about and roughly put it in these uh, clusters and so on. Um, that doesn't work well with the sliding window and the various knobs that I was talking about, right? Every, every week it's getting new data and it's expiring old data. I mean, it's a first stop measure, uh, a stopgap measure to prevent what you're talking about, but I feel like we could get better at that. Yep, question? I just want to point out like, uh, the, flake the flake analysis from the AI library to PV star, so that's available to test to do, to do the testing flakes part. So right. you just like deploy the AI library, send in your data, and get the results. Right. A couple of comments on the output. So as I mentioned earlier, there's nothing wrong with artificial neural networks or like any kind of neural networks. It's like the algorithms itself come with a certain set of parameters of what it actually defines. So right. as I said, like start simple, like start with clustering, like Mm -hmm. So Prasant was uh, highlighting that um, this same container is, is usable via the AI libraries, and you can call it by uh, um, OpenWhisk, serverless computing, to do this stuff as well. So you have another choice there. And in addition, he's encouraging everyone to start simple, try different techniques, see what works, what doesn't work. Just because, for example, neural networks didn't work for this case, doesn't mean it won't work for your case. Or try, try, try the basic... Uh, um, techniques that, that Prasanth was talking about in the previous talk. Um, I think Adam had his hand up earlier. Uh, yeah, first, I just want to say, I think you're exactly right. Um, the use of this add-on. I've been doing this with a whole array in my low tech human way for a couple of years, and every test play I look into turns out to be real positive. So, great idea. Um, question How do you look at identifying the list that introduce test plays? Like running the test three times, see if it gives you a flaky result? So 
That's, a, that's an interesting uh, idea. So the question is, um, so Adam was saying that he's seen this uh, in the source of his career that every test flake has a, has a, has a real bug behind it. Um, but the question was, can we figure out where these flakes are, where those bugs are, come from? Which commits introduce the flakes and thereby introduce a bug? And I, I, think, I think that's worth looking at. Um, the scale at which this is happening allows you perhaps not to do that as a gating measure before the commit goes in, but within the next day or two, you would have enough data to do something like that. It's all about making sure that, that we give enough data to the model to make such uh, decisions and we're not flooded with noise. We can pick out the ones that are, that are uh, pretty guaranteed to, to fit that, that criteria. Yep? So I agree with your claim, but I think it would make sense to then stop talking about flakes, actually. Because, you know, the flake, you go out, a snowflake melt, lands on you, it melts, and then you have to stop thinking about the flake. And that's the, that's the wrong mindset. That's right. And you list three of the major problems you said are race conditions. And so those typically only come up once in a while when you have testing. Right. Right. Yeah, I agree with that. Let's see if I can summarize uh, for the recording. Um, the comment was that it would be good to, if we could tr go away from calling these flakes, we call them what they really are, whether they're a race or an unreproducible bug or a, uh, some, other, uh, um, some other failure. I, and I agree with that. And that's part of the reason for doing this, is not just to have fun with the data, but also to help change our mindsets change our mindsets and prove, um, allow people to prove this for themselves, allow people to interact with the data. That's why that image and, and hopefully the, the D3 model where we can touch and feel it is so important because it, we can do a lot of stuff here with machine learning, but I'd also like machine learning to help teach us new things. And this goes back to uh, Moravec's paradox where um, machine learning is, uh, it, and, and machines in general, the way they act and behave are fundamentally unintuitive. So, so Moravec's paradox in so many words states that the things that we believe to be simple, such as walking down a staircase, are in fact very hard for a machine to accomplish. The things that we believe to be difficult, such as playing a game of chess, are pretty trivial for a machine in comparison. And so this, this, the underlying nature of how unintuitive it is to have an intelligence thinking a completely different way from us and allowing to us to learn and interact and allowing to affect our mindset is a very valuable tool. And so that, that's the underlying thing here and why we ended with that claim, because we really want to start thinking about this problem differently. Yes, Stephen. So this is great. This is kind of a year-long journey, I know, from like inception to testing and refining it. Now that it's like proven, right, so you, you know that it works, is there, is there oh, or maybe it already is, Yeah. Um, so the question is, can, could we integrate this into the container verification pipeline that we use in Fedora and in, Red, in RHEL uh, and in OpenShift? And can we put this into other systems? And so this is part of the reason that I'm pushing so hard on everyone to ramp up the scale of the testing. Um, it's very, in order to use this effectively, I, will, I would say we should be running about a million integration tests a month on the project. And that may seem like a high bar, but it's not that hard once you apply basic engineering to the, to the task. Cockpit's a million-ish, 800,000 actually. Integration tests per month run on five or six beefy systems. Like, it's not running on a massive cluster of, of, of stuff. And, um, and that, that's because basic engineering was applied to this problem. One of the reasons is that CI is essentially very, very, very repetitive. Extremely repetitive. Look at those numbers. Let's see. Look at these numbers here. Ah. Ah. These numbers. 
my gosh, two million, two and a half million tests, and we're really real failures plus test flakes, which are the bugs. Uh, or actually, all of these are bugs. That's a, that's a tiny amount. That's, that's an order of magnitude off. 99% of what's happening here is green, just churning, burning CPU power for the same results every single time. In theory, if we got in and started micromanaging this as humans, it is essentially saying, wait a second, 99% of the effort of these machines are wasted in order to produce this tiny amount of result. The, the, the root cause of this is CI is extremely repetitive, extremely repetitive. It's also very easy for the kernel to optimize the I.O., scale it up to insane uh, densities that you would never think possible when you just, just take some things out of its way. Um, that's a whole other talk that, that we, can, we can get to. But in other words, yes, it's possible, but the requirement is to scale up our testing to a level where um, the, there's enough data. And we know that it's possible to do that. We have the techniques. Yep. Mm-hmm. But if you look at the actual failures as a pivot of the real failures, that's not a lake anymore, right? Right. Yeah. And so Tom makes a good point that this is, again, another example of the unintuitive nature of machines interacting in our projects. Um, and I agree with that completely. Maybe so. Exactly. So the comment was maybe we should vary some response and actually introduce fuzzing actively. It turns out for most projects, that's not necessary. But I will say, like it, as we said at the end here, if your testing system is not having any flakes and you've tried everything else, you should probably start introducing variations in your timing and in your network response and all that to find the bugs that you know must be there. So are we out of time? Three minutes, we can go. Any more questions? So all of this is available for you to play with. There's GitHub pull requests open. Rado is working on um, kernel stack traces. Um, and Prasant has an API for calling this in a serverless fashion. Um, so, and, and e even if these things, uh, even if you end up playing with this and say, wait a second, this is not the kind of problem I'm trying to solve, Get familiar with the techniques. Get familiar with how um, this can affect your mindset and start to change the way you develop software. And um, yeah, I'm excited about what we all come up with. Thanks. <laughs>